My name is Hannah Lewis and I work for the National Center for Appropriate Technology. Um, it's a national organization that does work in renewable energy and sustainable agriculture. We have offices in Montana, California, Arkansas, Pennsylvania, and Iowa. We have an office in Des Moines and Rich, Dana, and I work there. Um, and ATRA is um, a national sustainable agriculture information service that is funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Okay. Okay, Local Foods 101. Um, I, I'm curious who, if everybody's familiar with the term local foods. Raise your hand if you're not. <laughs> I, that's probably why you came here, because you have an idea about it. Um, and what about what, what is a local food system? Anyone want to venture a definition? Maybe one where it travels less than 50 miles to get to your table. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a good definition. Well, so a food Sorry. system, okay. A food, uh, so the food system basically encompasses inputs, farm, farm inputs, food production, um, distribution, processing, um, consumption, and then disposal of food waste. So that's a food system. And local, um, whether it's local, de sort of depends on your definition. Local may be 50 miles. Local may be a whole, within a whole state or within um, a few different states. So it, it kind of depends on, um, on, you know, there's a lot of different definitions for it. Well, local foods, I think everyone has become more and more familiar with the idea because you've been hearing about it on the news. Um, the New York Times has a section that just focuses on local foods. They have a regular article series. Um, everyone knows about the Ob Obama's planting a vegetable garden at the White House. Um, urban farming a bit closer to the sun, that's a story um, about New York City that passed um, they, they passed a tax incentive policy to encourage people to plant um, vegetation and gardens on their rooftops um, for a number of reasons. Um, of course, it's fresh. The, the chef grew it. Um, it's about uh, a chef that's just growing his own food to use in the restaurant. Um, can a farm state feed itself? This is a really recent ar article um, about Illinois, the state of Illinois passing a policy just to, to, to try to make buying local foods easier for public institutions. Um, and then making sure backyard fruit isn't wasted is about an organization called Food Forward and it's, it's a group of people that are saying, okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, fruit trees at, in people's yards and parks that are growing fruit. Nobody's eating it. People don't think of that as food. And we also have a lot of hungry people. So let's go and collect all of that food that nobody's eating and bring it to the food bank. So it's just an initiative somebody came up with to, to try to um, make two ends connect. So I'm going to go back. Okay, and this was just a couple years ago. The, the, local, the label says, forget organic, eat local. So it's just to put it in context of sort of the publicity local food is getting. Here's something that just came out that's really encouraging. Kathleen Merrigan is the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And um, she said this just recently, August 26th. I suspect that many USDA programs are underutilized by those seeking to build local and regional food systems. I would like to play the role of matchmaker during this administration. By which I mean, or by this I mean, I will work to help the USDA program administrators understand how our programs can better serve your efforts to build local and regional food systems, as well as highlight for you USDA programs that present great opportunity for the work you do. So then she went on to identify three programs within rural development that would be, so those are funding sources for people who are working on food systems development to access that she thought people might not be aware of that she thought should go to that use. So that's really encouraging. Um, and sort of a, um, the different local foods systems kind of encompasses a lot of different approaches ranging from commercial agriculture to subsistence farming or gardening. Um, and just a few of them 
farm to school. I'm going to talk about that in more detail a little bit uh, in the next few slides. Direct marketing. Who um, is community supported agriculture a familiar term? Is that where you all buy into a farm and then you get to come and harvest some? Yeah, exactly. You pay in advance when the farmer actually needs the money in the spring and then they deliver weekly boxes of produce. Um, and there's often a lot of ways for the people to engage in the farm activities. Farmers markets um, and farm stands, I, I think in the late 1980s, community supported agriculture was pretty much unknown and I think today it's um, sort of a, a kitchen table term. Um, so there's been a huge growth in all of these things. Um, wholesale markets, selling to restaurants, there's um, Cisco, Sodexo, some big distributors are carrying local foods. There's also small nonprofits. Red Tomato is an example from Boston that are aggregating produce from small farmers and bringing it to retail or restaurant outlets. Um, urban farming, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit um, in more detail too. Community gardens um, and gleaning. And gleaning, I had just shown that example of the organization in LA that was gleaning. And there it is. Okay, farm to school. Um, so, does anyone live in an area where there's a farm to school program in Iowa? Um, well, the, the farm to school movement started about 12 years ago or so. Um, and uh, National Farm to School Network is, is sort of a meta organization that started just a few years ago to provide technical assistance to organizations or communities that were trying to get a farm to school program going in their community. And so here, here's some research and statistics that they came up with because they're connected to a lot of these programs. They're now the, the vast majority of US states have some sort of farm to school program going on. Um, the number of farm to school programs in the US is 2051 and often those projects are implemented at the district level so there's a lot more schools that are involved. Um, and what farm to school programs look like is they almost always integrate curriculum development with trying to, with procurement and trying to bring local foods into cafeterias. And so um, uh, and, and, and then often also a school garden. But the idea is that you don't, you want kids to, to eat healthy food, you want to improve their nutrition, develop their lifestyle habits, but you, you also want them to understand, you know, about nutrition, about, um, about um, healthy, healthy living, and about sort of the connection of, of where your food comes from. So that's, and, and another reason to integrate curriculum into school to farm to school programs is because um, uh, it, is because it's it's a good it's sort of a good first step to do to kind of build that relationship with the school um, policy sort of the policy initiatives that have made farm to school become grown I mean this is a lot of growth just in 12 years there's all of this going on um, and so. The Child Nutrition Act um, was established many years ago, but it's uh, reauthorized every five years. And in 2004, um, the Child Nutrition Act established a farm to cafeteria program. So that was really great because basically it's sort of legitimizing this and saying this is important for children's health. However, they did not fund it. So it was an unfunded mandate. Um, the, another thing in that farm bill was that to receive, to receive federal funds for school lunches, you need to have a wellness policy. And um, that just is sort of a tool then that people that want to develop farm to school projects in their um, schools can use to um, start to create language that the school would have to follow. Um, so the, Ch the Child Nutrition Act expires this month. And so there's an opportunity to um, to try to get that funded. And so the National Farm to School Network requests that Congress enact $50 million in mandatory funding for 100 uh, to 500 projects per year. So right now, all of these farm to school projects have been using you know, different sorts of funding sources. 
Um, another, th another policy that has helped farm to school is, that, is the farm bill, the most recent farm bill, um, allows schools, normally the, the public institutions are accountable to the public um, in that they have to find the cheapest the source of what they're going to do so that they're sort of responsible with federal funds. But this allows, um, this allows a preference for, like a geographical preference for procure um, procurement policies at schools. So, you know, if, if, if um, food from a local farmer is a little bit more, it doesn't mean that they are not allowed to buy it. So. I mean like 5% more? Or yeah, they, yeah, it, it specifies a range. Like 20% that might be too much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it specifies a range that something around 5%. Um, and, and often, um, Local areas do those by themselves. They, they identify how much. Um, so here's an example. Missoula County School District um, in 2005 initiated a school to farm project. And I just thought I would describe how that happened. So you can kind of visualize how it might happen if you're interested in doing that in, in your community. So. Um, this started with actually an NCAT project called Grow Montana. And um, the person, one of our employees, Christy McMullen, who works with Grow Montana, simply began with a discussion with the food service director. Um, and, sh and she said, you know, here's, here's all the benefits of farm to school programs. You know, is this something you guys would be interested in? The far and the food service director said, no, I really, I, I'm pressed for time. I don't have a big budget. I'm sorry, I can't. And so she said, well, what if we get the money and we do the work for you? And so that was sort of the in. And um, so a grad student was hired to, to do all the coordination, find the local farms, figure out you know, who could source what, what the prices would be that the farmers would need, what would the prices would be that the school district could pay. And just all of that, all that like time intensive work. Um, and so that became a model for um, a project w which grew out of that called, um, w called uh, Food Corps, <laughs> sorry, just based on that, um, Food Corps. And so now there's five people that are AmeriCorps VISTA volunteers working in Montana, and they're working in specific school districts to get a farm to school program going. Um, and so they're, they're doing all of, um, all of the work of getting something started and then right now they're in the third year and so they're going to they're gonna see, well, is this something that can, can carry on on its own without the VISTA volunteer doing it now that they've made all the connections and set up the structures and the curriculum and everything. Um, but the way, the way this project started with the Missoula School District is that you, d you don't need to say, okay, We've got a tall task. We need to f have every school lunch have local foods from now on. You know, that's, that's gigantic. So what you can do is just have sort of a promotional event. Let's have a, a Montana meal lunch day. And so you just say, you know, September 15th, we're, we're, all the kids are going to have Montana-grown potatoes, whatever it is. Um, and then, then you can kind of raise awareness, and it's not that hard to source food just for that one event. And that can kind of get the wheels rolling. Um, and so they've really grown. Since 2005, the first year, they, they had 4,000 um, pounds of locally produced, Montana-produced food, and um, to this year, 50,000 pounds. So, and they've, they've, been, they've done such a good job that the National Food System Food Service Management Institute, which basically does trainings for school food service staff and directors, um, is, is using the Missoula School District as a model to start a training program. So that's exciting that they're interested in that, too. And so they'll be teaching other um, school uh, food service directors. In Iowa, we have a farm to school program within the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. Um, there are currently nine active chapters, um, and they each get just a little pot of seed money to pay for staff time, to retrofit the kitchen. One of the big obstacles with farm to school is that those kitchens are 
designed so that they just have to sort of heat up food. There's a, not a lot of processing that needs to happen. Um, and so if, if you're bringing in whole carrots, whole potatoes, you need, you need to retrofit not only the staff skills, but also the equipment that's there. Or you need to find an entrepreneur in the community who can do that processing for you. So the, what the Iowa, um, what IDALS is doing is just a little bit of money so that they can kind of figure out what they're going to do, maybe buy some extra supplies and that sort of thing. And AS for Apple is another sort of just really small project where basically they paired orchards together with 10 schools and said, okay, let's just, let's just do this effort, um, get um, apples out to skid kids for a snack time. In 10 schools, let's just do that. And, the, you know, and, and so that was... That was a project that started to create relationships between schools and orchards. And um, so the person in charge of that is with I IDALS. That's the contact. And if you go to the IDALS website, you can find out how to get your school district kind of going on a farm to school project. OK, urban farming is another element. I'll stop. Does anyone have any questions? OK. Um, and just go ahead and raise your hand if you do. Um, urban farming, um, does anyone, has anyone sort of seen examples of urban farming? Yeah, seen on TV. Yeah. <laughs> right. Chicago, yeah. New York, cities everywhere. Yeah. Anything in Iowa? Uh, I haven't seen it. I think the jail that was... And actually, um, the a park and recs in Des Moines had a had an employee named Tiva Dawson who was doing some really great work for a while and she established some community gardens in Des Moines and she also got a community food project grant to establish edible landscapes in Des Moines so at, at schools and at parks so there's fruit trees and brambles and the idea is that people will just come and harvest it as they like um, but yeah so exactly there's a there's a lot of, you know, if you kind of start walking through cities with the idea of urban gardening in mind, you suddenly start seeing all of these places where food could be grown. And again, it's, it's for subsistence, it's for reducing your grocery bill, and, and there's also a possibility of being a small-scale entrepreneurial. There's, there's nice stepping stones because you can start producing and then sell your surplus at a farmer's market. So it's, uh, it's kind of a neat way to become an entrepreneur. Um, and there's one of our co MCAT colleagues um, has, is a certified trainer for spin farming, which means small plot intensive um, gardening. And it also it in integrates a business model for urban farming. And, and according to his research, um, you can make $50,000 a year on, um, I think that's gross, on a half an acre. So there's special production t techniques, biointensive, where you, know, you can get a lot of yield if you, you know, if you really take care of the soil. Um, so, um, so again, economic, I touched on that, but this is, this is, um, this is from, this is a publication by the Community Food Security Coalition. And I'll just put a plug in right now for the Community Food Security Coalition. They're sort of the national leader on farm to school and on food security. So trying to get food to um, communities that low income communities and you know trying to make sure that people have a lots of different kinds of access to food where they otherwise wouldn't and would be hungry. Um, but the Community Food Security Coalition is having a conference in Des Moines. It's a national conference. It's a great conference, and it's happening um, October 10th to the 13th, I believe. So that's something just to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, so so you can reduce your grocery bill, um, and if you have surplus, you can you can sell that. Actually, uh, this uh, one of our another one of our NCAT colleagues, Barters. His, he, grow, he has laying hens and vegetables, and he barters that with his neighbors for um, other things that they can give to him. So that's pretty neat. Um, but a lot of people have community gardens or gardens, and they just really like to share produce. Rich brings me bags of produce <laughs> to work. <laughs> um, and 
but it's it, that's something I hear from community gardeners a lot is that it's it's really a huge and if you're a gardener you know that too it's fun to be able to give people something that's so wonderful like a fresh tomato um, but it opens up community space where people would people who would never interact with each other have the opportunity um, to share a space but not only that to talk to each other you know what are you growing what do you, how do you cook that some community gardens there's one in Des Moines that has uh, regular potluck on Sunday nights, um, so it's 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 just it's a great um, tool for sort of social community development um, and environmental. The foliage, it, you know, if you if you take sort of an asphalt or you know gravelly lot that kind of collects heat in the day, and you just turn that into greens and vegetables, you can actually lower the temperature in that area just a little bit. Um, in addition to making it beautiful and creating um, habitat for birds and insects and things like that um, and um, and then uh, uh, if any of you saw Leaf's presentation earlier he was talking about the energy in um, energy that goes into the whole food system and that's about 20 percent of the energy used and so one of the um, one of the energy uses of food, the food system is the distribution. Let's see. Does anyone know that figure, the average miles that food travels, fresh produce, to get to your plate? It's 1,200. I've, I've heard 1,500. Close enough. The job won't work. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Leopold Center did a study and um, comparing those two. And you also have to take into consideration the size of the truck and how, so if you're talking about a certain volume of produce and if it's a, if it's a national truck, it'll be a big semi and you know, it'll just be one trip. But if it's a local system, it'll be a smaller truck and you may have to go back and forth. So even taking that into account, um, the, the distance that, according to the Leopold Center, that, the, uh, that Iowa food travels is about 60 miles if it's, if it's local foods grown in Iowa. Um, uh, yeah, so and converting brown fields to green fields. Brown, f brown fields are sort of blighted, contaminated areas that there had been an industrial activity on and the government wants to try to clean those up and turn them into a better use. Um, so, so you can put gardens on there. Now, risks. Okay, growing food on previously <laughs> contaminated land. It's a little scary. But, but that's something that um, I think people that are working on this are really addressing. And so obviously do a soil test prior to planting, used raised beds. If you bring in a bunch of really nutrient rich con uh, compost, then the ro roots won't need to dig down deeper to, um, to what might be below that. Um, and fruiting plants to um, take up less heavy metals than, than potatoes. Or you can grow, I mean, if it's, if, it's, if it's a particular concern, you can simply just grow ornamentals. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, yeah? Have you seen much work on, like I've seen uh, stuff about growing oh, mushrooms uh, in like areas where there have been decent spills and stuff? Are huh. particular crops? Do you know much about that? But there are. Crops to, to I, those kind of risks? Yeah, yeah, there, there are. And there's a specific term for that. I can't remember the term, but um, there's... There are specific crops, and I think they're more like more leafy kinds of crops. Um, <laughs> yeah, but then but then the problem is, what do you do with those contaminated plants? I mean, obviously you won't. If it goes to the stems, you're all right. But if it goes yeah. to the part you eat, then you're in trouble. Well, I think the idea with some of these plants, like if you grow ornamentals to just remove the toxins, then you just take them off and, I don't know, bring them to a landfill. But that's, that's actually a question. What do you do with those contaminated plants? But yeah, that is a strategy and there are particular plants that will do that better than others. Um, here's an example. Has anyone here heard of growing power? Will Allen is uh, become sort of a superstar of late. He, he got the MacArthur Genius Award and he, he truly is a remarkable person. Um, so he, he bought the last two acre farm in Milwaukee. It's inside the city. There are six greenhouses. Um, he's growing, he's got aquaponics there so he's got fish 
Um, and, and the idea is that um, the nutrients from the fish manure, I guess, um, get cycled into the plants, and the plants take that up and clean the water, and then it can be, so then it's cleaned again for the fish. And so it serves a dual purpose. Um, and he's, he's doing worm composting, so he has huge windrows of California red rig wriggler worms, and then he can take, you know, um, plant waste or food waste, coffee, coffee grinds or, you know, things from restaurants, and the, and the worms will just turn that into an incredibly rich compost. So he uses that. So basically, he's addressing the fertility need of being in a small urban space by using food waste and having the worms digest that. Um, he also has a biogas digester that, um, that processes waste and then and supplies some of his energy needs. Um, and he's got, he's got goats and turkeys and chickens. This is all on two acres in the city. And what they do with that, um, they, have a, they have a little retail store there. They have a market basket, which um, is, so there's a very strong target with this program on low-income communities and food security. And so the market basket basically brings produce, including their own produce, including other local farm produce, including produce from, you know, a distributor, but brings that into areas where there isn't a good, like, grocery store. So, so they're really trying to get, um, they're trying to address hunger at the same, and nutrition at the same time that they're, you know, working, working with youth and, um, and, they, and so the youth can have apprenticeships. They learn these really interesting technical, natural systems. They learn how to do the marketing of it. They participate in that. Um, and, and so Growing Power has trainings. And they train, I mean, they just have, they have people from all over the country going there to learn not only about their sort of natural technical processes, but also the social um, programs that they engage in. Um, Maybe I won't go too much through this slide. Um, another approach to local food systems building is to just start in the community and not to have a particular project like farm to school, but to work with the community um, to get stakeholders together to have a discussion about, okay, what are our needs in this community? What are our assets? Where do we want to go? Are we happy with the food system we have? What can we do to increase opportunities for small farmers? Where, where are the farmers that grow here selling to? Is it going out? Is, are, the, are the dollars that we spend on food going out of the county? And so um, there's been a lot of work in Iowa. There's, an there's a network called the Regional Food Systems Working Group that's funded and coordinated by the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, which is based at Iowa State University. And basically, it convenes, it funds and convenes groups in um, all four corners of the state and in central Iowa. There's a couple groups. Um, and it convenes those groups about four times a year to share their experiences. So there's some that are farther along, and they say, okay, here's how we started. You know, here are the partners that we worked with. Here's where we stumbled. <coughs> You know, and, and so it's a, it's a great opportunity for people who are interested in that to, to share information and learn from each other and not kind of make the same mistakes. Um, food policy councils, is that a familiar term? No. <laughs> um, food, food policy, so the, the U.S. doesn't really have food policy. I mean, they have Food and Drug Administration, but, but uh, you know, um, policies that address sort of the quality of our foods, the, um, you know, where it's grown, all of this stuff that we're talking about isn't something that the government usually addresses. So people have come together to create food policy councils. The, the different partners that it's supposed to be a multi-stakeholder group, so, you know, the health community, the education community, the low-income community, um, it's good to have government buy-in. You can have a food policy council that's housed within one of the offices of the government, or it can just be a, like, a grassroots coalition. But they can do a lot of things. They can identify what the issues are, and they can, um, they can do public education and suggest policy changes, such as simply saying, you know, saying to the government, like, like, like Illinois just did, 
We, we think um, buying from Iowa farmers or Illinois farmers, wherever you are, is important. And um, we are going to, you know, like public procurement. So we're going to choose to buy from local farms before we buy from um, outside when, when possible. Um, so food policy councils can say, this is something we'd like to do, this is important, and propose that. And just take a leadership role on changes. And then I mentioned the food core, so that's, that's an, a nice strategy for, you know, getting AmeriCorps VISTA volunteers to, to do the work of getting, getting something up and running. Um, so building local food systems is a really collaborative process inherently because you're trying to deal with a whole system, not one entity. So you need a lot of people to share their knowledge, share their views, share their expertise. Um, and um, and work together. Um, I think one of the stumbling blocks is dedicated staff time because unless you get a position funded, now this is really neat, in Pottawatomie County um, they've had a regional food systems working group and that's been volunteers, you know, somebody puts in 5% of their time, somebody else puts in 8% of their time and you know, they're like extension, extension directors or other people um, and so that works really well, but it's, it's also important, and Pottawatomie County realized this, to have one person whose sole job it is to coordinate all of that activity. Um, and so they, they funded a five-year position for a, a local foods coordinator in Pottawatomie County, which is pretty neat. Um, community engagement, that's, um, that's key. Um, and then these are some of the stumbling blocks that you'll have to deal with. You know, can, can you grow, can you, um, are urban areas zoned for commercial agriculture? Well, you may need to make some policy changes there. Um, and then season extension. Obviously, the, far, the growing season is opposite of the school season, so how, how do you deal with that? Well, you can just focus on the spring and fall, or you can do more processing and, and um, try to get stuff in there year-round. Oops, that's the wrong direction. Um, ATRA, again, is a resource. Um, we, our information is targeted to farmers and ranchers, but we have publications like How to Sell to Local Institutions. Um, we have a, publica a new publication called Start a Farm in the City, and it, deal and it addresses a lot of these topics and how to deal with them. Um, so we so just browse our website. It's pretty interesting, and we're we're about to launch a local foods website that organizes all the information that we have, um, especially for local food systems. Um, but like I mentioned, Community Food Security Coalition is a real leader. They're having a conference in Des Moines in October. Leopold Center here at Iowa State University. Food Roots is. Um, does anyone have a buy fresh, buy local campaign? Yeah, okay. So foods, Food Roots is the, um, the national entity that coordinates Buy Fresh, Buy Local. Um, World Hunger Year does a lot of assist assisting of organizations, sort of capacity building with organizations that work in these areas. Um, and the Good Food Network is, is sort of an information sharing on a regional basis. Let's see if there's anything else. That's it. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank